Okay, you guys, uh, presumptive ID and gram chemicals for gram negatives. This is basically, it's a review, again, we're not really going to go into this lecture that much. Basically, I would suggest that you look at that first lecture that I gave you from the other student that listed like the urease and citrate and that thing, because that was like a fantastic um, PowerPoint, and you should be using that to study more than this. This goes into a little bit more of like shape and margins and that type of thing, but you will need to know these terms for the lab practicals when I'm asking you to describe the colonies. You're going to have to start using like this type of language, okay? Um, second thing is, the antibiotic PowerPoint, very overwhelming, okay? What I did was um, I printed you guys out like an outline form of the antibiotic PowerPoint. It might be a little bit more helpful than actually looking at the PowerPoint and trying to study off of the PowerPoint, okay? Basically it says the same thing, but yeah. Uh, that study you can um, the and example. The yeah. Is that pretty good study review? Or? Let's see. I'm trying to think. What did he get in the class? I think he got a B plus or B, B B plus, something like that. But it's very, it's very you're welcome. It's very thorough. So some of that stuff you might not even need. You know what I mean? If you're comfortable with it, he went over like everything. So so he's pretty good. He's pretty good. He would make one for the class all the time. So they had it pretty good with him. Okay? All right. So, okay, you had objectives. I already passed that. So importance of colony morphology. So you guys can start seeing why colony morphology is getting important into the diagnostic laboratory itself, just like what you did today with gram staining. So, not only that, but you can play a role in quality control. For example, I don't know if the rest of you guys know, but we have two fungal plates growing in this class, which is a little bit creepy. One's from a microscope and one's from the, um, the handicap door thing that you press when the door opens. And just the fact that it's fungal, because I think it's fungal, Richard's not convinced yet, <laughs> but um, it shouldn't really be there. <laughs> so. Not so good. So quality control, okay? In terms of hospital, you're enhancing the quality of patient care because you're trying to get rapid reporting of results. Because basically, once you have the morphology, you can really start honing in on your biochemical tests. All right, interpretation. So you're looking at stuff, examples over here, fastidious organisms. You know, these are going to be the hard-to-grow ones that require additional growth factors, such as X and V. Um, Neisseria meningitis, Haemophilus influenzae is an example. Um, BAPs, looking at hemolysis, chocolate. This will take it a step further. This would be an example of a fastidious organism growth. You would use chocolate. Um, and then you have your MAC. Is this going to drive you guys crazy because I can turn it off? Otherwise, it's probably going to be beeping all the time. Do you want me to turn it off? Yeah, yeah no. And then bother me. Yeah, you probably are. Like so, Mac, what are you looking at when you're using Mac plates? What kind of lactose fermenters versus non fermenters? If I have a fermenter, what is it? Translucent. Or non fermenters, translucent fermenters, or the pink fuchsia? Thing? Yeah, pink fuchsia. Give me an example of non fermenter. Shigel is a non-fermenter. Pseudomonas, non-fermenter. What did you say? <laughs> oh, you said, um, um. Okay. Mac plates also uh, selected for gram-negative. Gram-negative enteryx is usually what, so gut bacteria, okay? So this would be a map right here. This would be something like E. coli. So that would be a lactose fermenter, okay? So you guys are used to this already. Okay, colony characteristics. Homolysis, the difference between alpha and beta. Remember, you need to know that on the test. The other thing that people sometimes forget is on alpha is that not only is it a partial lysis of um, the erythrocytes, but it also can turn into like green pigmentation as well. Okay, it can be either or or sometimes both. Whereas beta, you're just looking at complete clearing, which would be streptiogenes, which 
Um, let me see. I have one out here for you guys. The other thing is, I noticed some of you guys, when you're looking at them, you're not looking at them right. This isn't a good example. This is Staph aureus. But when you're going to look at hemolysis, you want to be doing it this way and see the clearing around it that way. You can't be looking at it like this, or you're not going to be seeing the clearing. Okay? Just so you have that under control. Okay, size. So now when we're talking about this stuff, this is what I mean when you're going to have to start using these terms when we're talking about colonies in the lab. So it's a visual characteristic, not too complicated here, large, medium, small, and you have pinpoint colonies. And I think you guys have all seen the various uh, bacteria that we have. They're all different kinds of shapes. Remember, Klebsiella is kind of mucoid and kind of like goes together. It's not very pinpoint, like a staph epidermis. Um, interestingly enough, gram positives produce smaller colonies than gram negatives. And then on that same note, staphs are usually larger than streps. So when you see that, streps are usually hard to see on the BAP, pl BAP plates. Okay? Now, that size, the other thing you have is a form or a margin. This is the edge of the colonies and the form. So when I'm saying edge of the colonies, you're literally looking like at the side of the plate to see how the edge is shaped, okay? So you're not looking at it like this. You're actually taking it and looking at it kind of like in a sideways view, okay? So you have uh, smooth, rough, irregular, which I would say your fungal thing is definitely irregular. Swarming. And swarmy which is a hazy blanket of growth. Um, usually they use this one for Proteus, vulgaris, or even Mirabilis is um, an example of swarmy uh, bacteria, okay? That's a picture of it right there, of Proteus. So it goes out from the center and swarms out that way, okay? How is um, like a biofilm, how do we uh, describe its size? That's a very good question. Biofilm, let's think about that. How would you describe the size of biofilm? For example, if you guys have looked at Pseudomonas in here, it sometimes doesn't even look like you have anything on the plate, right? You actually have to swab it to get the color off the plate, and then you're like, oh, I actually have bacteria. Could you use biofilm as a descriptive term? You could use biofilm as a descriptive term, and in that is a special case, which that's an important point that Lance just made. Because large really doesn't cut it. It's beyond large. It is a biofilm. It's basically blending into one another. Okay? Um, Pseudomonas, that would be your example of a biofilm right there. Okay? All right. Elevation, you're tilting the plate. Okay? So flat raised, convex or dome. You can have an actual depressed center or a bulging center. I spelled that wrong. But, um, we ha they have really good pictures of this stuff in your book. If you guys have taken a look at your book yet, there's great pictures of this kind of stuff. So the elevation is another term that you guys will have to be familiar with again. Your other one is going to be density, transparent, translucent, and opaque. Anybody know what is the difference between these three? In terms of like color, would you say? You might not know this just because I'm talking micro lab. It's not like what you're thinking English term version, you're talking micro lab. Transparent, so that window, translucent, and, and uh, opaque is opaque. Okay, yeah, opaque would be hard to see through, almost like a blackish color or whatever. And usually when they're talking about transparent for colony shape, you're almost talking about white for transparent. Okay? Translucent would almost be like a grayish color. Okay? In terms of your micro definitions. So another picture here, yellow colonies. This is actually Neisseria. Okay, color and consistency. You see how very detailed this can get? You're talking about elevation, density, now the color and consistency. Okay? What you do with this is you actually touch with the loop and actually look at the loop to find out the following, whether it's brittle, creamy, dry, or waxy. C 
creamy like Ciella pneumonia or oxytoca. It just kind of like slides right off of the plate. Um, dry would be, let's say, like a strep pyogenes. It's very hard to get it off of the plate. It's very dry. It's not easy to grow. Waxy, I'm kind of at a loss here. I'm not really sure of a waxy example for you guys. So don't exactly worry about coming up for an example for me since I don't know the answer to that one. I saw um, on a patient's uh, chart uh, lab notes that you straw. A straw? Yeah, that can be another one too. There's something that smells like straw or hay or something like that to a, to a certain bacterium, but I don't remember what it is. Um, this would be uh, the picture of the Kirby Bowers that we were just talking about. And this would be like the clearing of the zone of inhibition versus not being susceptible or being a little bit susceptible. Okay, that's what that would look like. Okay, odor is another good one. So you have a lot of teachers that totally freak out or people that freak out about actually smelling the plates, but some of them actually do have a very distinctive smell. So aureus, an old sock. Okay, but like how I have to be descriptive here without washing for a couple days. I did not wash the sock for a couple days. Do that. It's more evident. The thing that's weird about this is it's more evident when it's growing on an MSA plate. You get that smell more. Pseudomonas, very fruity or grape-like. I don't know if you guys have smelled that one yet, but it definitely has some kind of a Kool-Aid-y smell to it. Asha was the one of the teachers that. Well, it's not funny. She says, smell it, but then you go to smell it, oh, don't smell it. Yeah, I know. A lot of people, like old school people in the lab, will actually smell it because that's where you get your information from. I like this one. Mirabilis, Proteus Mirabilis, it's putrid. Um, Homophilus, a musty basement. <laughs> and Nicardia, my favorite, a freshly plowed field. Okay? It's like a cotton commercial. Um, Growth of organisms in liquid. You can see here, this is the thio-liquid media. Do you guys remember thiofluid? What type of media am I talking about? Broth. Well, broth, but like what type? Is it differential? Is it um, selected? What is it? That wasn't the answer, but what is it? What did you say? Differential? Because it has ego. It's technically classified as a reducing media. Um, yeah, it turns out the, the reducing media. Because you can see here where the growth is at the top, and it drives off the free CO2. Okay? So on these, they call them binder streamers. This would be a puff ball over here. <laughs> All right. Turbidity, this is what I was talking about before, about the McFarland standards. Um, I don't know where they got to. If you want to just pass these around. You guys can see when it goes from 1.0 to 5.0, it gets more turbid as it goes. So you're talking about the cloudiness. All right, gram chemical biomedia. What do I want to say about this? Hmm. All right. Your big thing here is you're going to have to know these tests. You're going to have to know the end product. And I think instead of honing in on these, except for the LIA and the SIMS, you have to look at this. The rest of them, I think you guys should go back to that original PowerPoint that was talking about the media in the, bi in the uh, microbiology lab. It did a good point of telling you what the TSIs were for what the KAs are for, and TSI and KA are almost interchangeable, by the way. They can use kind of both. Um, remember on those two, they're hydrogen sulfide production. So those are the red slants, and you can get black in those, which would be something from like salmonella and even proteus, okay? Methyl red and both, that one is often referred to as MRBP. So if you see MRBP, that's the test that we're talking about. And that's going to determine end products of glucose fermentation. You have the indole test, um, urease test. That one, remember, is going to be hot pink if it has if it's positive for urease. And then the Simon citrate. Carbohydrate fermentation, an example of that would be OF media. 
you guys haven't seen that one yet, it's green and yellow. It was in the picture of the original um, slide from a couple from last week. Okay, this is the oxidation fermentation test right here. Just kind of recapping again. These are pictures of the TSI test. These are all different combinations that you can get, okay? So you can see here, if it's cracked media, it's definitely producing gas, okay? So dependent on if it's yellow, if it's red-yellow, if it's black, whatever, it's gonna, do, it's gonna tell you which carbohydrate it's actually utilizing, okay? On this exam, I'm not asking you for combinations of this. I'm not gonna throw up it's yellow butt, yellow slant, what's going on here? I'm just gonna, I just want you to know what does the test actually do? What is the TSI test, okay? Is um, the whites up on the, the, every other tube, is that anything? No, it's just crap that's growing up. But, and the other thing that you can see here too is, um, it's not really used for this, but you can almost see the stabs or the motility. Even though that, remember which test that should be in the of Sims, sulfur, indole, motility, okay? This gives you a little bit of the uh, TSI um, formulation of what's what, like what, what kind of fermentation it is. Hydrogen sulfide production is gonna be black, okay? Okay. Methyl red test, this is just giving you some background on the methyl red test. You're not required to know this on the first exam. It just gives you some background for the laboratory itself. And then you have the VP test, that's gonna give you background as well. I'm not asking you anything on those two slides, okay? Amino acid utilization, you're gonna to have to know that these two are examples of amino acid utilization. And then your miscellaneous test, we went over most of these. I'm not asking you anything that you haven't already seen before. Okay, we did go over citrate. We didn't go over DNA, so don't worry about that one. I love my spelling on here. No, reduction. Um, nitrate reduction we haven't gone over. Oxidase and urease. Have we gone over oxidase at all? I don't think we have, right? So you can just catalyze. Isn't that just the one that you use the peroxide, not peroxide, peroxide, right? Catalase, Catalase hydrogen there, peroxide. And it makes a little... The bubbles, bubble like yeah. Peroxide. That one you're going to use a ton next week for the staph and strep species. Totally always about catalase. Oxidase, you use it, you put it on like a, a swab and put a little drop on the swab and if it turns purple or blue, it's positive for oxidase. Okay? All right. Why doesn't the antibiotic lyse human cells for this? What's the reason? Because our cells are made of cell wall. What is cell wall? And what is the cell wall made of, Lauren? What is it? Epithelium. Epithelium. Yes, thank you. Is that what you were going to say to you, Lance? Well, I was just going to say that our cell walls, I was going to get a little more technical. See, he was going to get a little more technical. We'll let you get away with your answer. All right, well, let's do it in very way. Objective here, let's just skip over these. Dude, you know something? I've never had objectives for my lectures at all until NACLs came. And then I'm like, oh, I gotta go back and write objectives for every single lecture. That was some fun times. <laughs> and man, they grilled you on it too. They were like, why do you have this for this? <laughs> it's pretty funny. Okay, um, antimicrobial drugs. You guys need to know the definitions of these. Just make like no cards or something um, to know. Remember, one of the things that I always like to point out is about chemotherapy. Everybody's always thinking like cancer chemotherapy. Not necessarily. We're talking about just the use of drugs to treat a disease, okay? And then the difference between an antimicrobial drug interfering with the growth of microbes within a host versus antibiotic, which inhibits another microbe. Okay, so know the difference between the two. Um, superbug, multi-resistant, a bacteria that carries several resistant genes. Anybody think of an uh, example of superbug lately? Klebsiella. One that's, what? Klebsiella. Klebsiella. 
I guess you could go, classify MRSA or now VERSA because it's vancomycin resistant, almost like a superbug as well. Okay? Then you have bacteria cytoval agent will actually kill the microbe, and then bacteria static will actually inhibit the growth, growth of the microorganism. Okay? All right. The other thing is, you're going to have to know and have examples of broad spectrum versus narrow spectrum drugs. Okay? So I listed up there, ampicillin would be considered a broad spectrum drug, which is probably one of the problems with why it's becoming, you know, things are becoming resistant to it because it's prescribed for everything. Um, narrow spectrum, it's only going to be effective against specific families of bacteria. Erythromycin is a good example of that. I believe I asked you something about that on the test, one of these, okay? And then you have a super infection, which should be a secondary infection superimposed on an earlier, earlier one. When I'm talking about HIV, I was talking about the fact that like people usually go in and they have an infection, like pneumonia or something like that, and then they find out that they are HIV positive or they're in that HIV stage which would be considered then you have a super infection because it's a secondary infection, okay? All right, selection of the antimicrobial agents. These are all of the things that go into play here when they're deciding what kind of antimicrobial drug are we gonna give them, okay? First and foremost, what's gonna be the lethal effect against the microorganism? Is it gonna have one? And then the second big thing would be, is there a low toxicity towards the host? Does that play, play into effect, okay? Um, what's the host immune system? You're not gonna give somebody that's on chemotherapy full-blown, heavy-duty uh, antibiotic drugs because their immune system's already shot, okay? What does the host organ function look like? Um, can it be readily distributed through the blood? And then what's the age of the patient, and where's the site of the infection? That's going to play a part of the selection process as well. Were you going to say something? I heard uh, you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, no, you're fine. The uh, organ function, that's really important because they have poor organ function or poor uh, liver function. Which is actually common a lot, and yeah. with a lot of drugs, to be on a lot of drugs, poor organ function, kidney function, that type of thing. So even some of your uh, go-to antidepressants that are out there, like lithium, carbonate, that can do damage to your kidneys, right, on a long-term basis. So that comes into play too. And then how about if you're having to take antibiotics on top of that? Is it not a good situation to be in? Okay. Again, bacterial cytal versus bacterial static. Just remember the difference between these things. It shouldn't be very hard. Okay, suicidal basically is how I remember it, and bacteria static is the other way. Okay, um, bacteria cytal, you have things such as penicillin, cephalosporin, and vancomycin would be um, examples of bacteria cytal. Bacteria static, on the other hand, you're talking about tetracyclines, sulfas, erythromycins. Okay? Dude, if you guys are sitting here and you're not taking notes on this, or you think you have it in your head, I hope so, because I'm testing you on this stuff, all right? I don't want it to be like a big freak out surprise. I know this section really well. Yeah, have you had this section? This is taken actually from a 2010 thing, too. No, just so I can hear short my pharmacy. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> all right, action of antimicrobial drugs. Basically, you're talking about five main things here, okay? And this is going to be on the test again. And by the way, your test is 50 questions, multiple choice. The rest are short answers. No. And I don't remember. This might be a short answer. I don't remember if I put this on or not. But action. Inhibit cell wall synthesis. Inhibit protein synthesis. Nucleic acid replication. Injury to plasma membrane. That would be like a polymyxin B, which is a topical. Um, inhibition of synthesis of essential metabolites. And there you have your sulfide right there, or sulfa, I should say, okay? So remember those five things would be the action of antimicrobial drugs, how they actually work. There it is again in just a list form. Now, 
here comes the problem. This is where it gets a little tricky because now you have to remember, oh yeah, what's doing what here? So penicillin, you're talking about inhibitor of cell wall synthesis, okay? Um, one of the things I want to point out for you guys to remember is we're talking about penicillin G. You've got to know the differences here. G would be IV use, B is oral use, and benzathine penicillin is intramuscular use, okay? So know the difference between those three, because you do get asked about that, all right? Um, this, these are also beta-lactin antibiotics. Does anybody know what I'm talking about when I say that? And what the problem is with beta-lactamase, or beta-lactam, I should say, and bacteria have beta-lactamase? They put it, so greater than Say it louder. Oh, um, yeah, if they have that beta-lactamase, they can cut that molecule and make it heavier than that can. Exactly, which is one of the problems with like something like MRSA, or whatever, because they carry that gene in their beta-lactamase. Okay? Still talking about inhibitor of cell wall synthesis, another beta-lactam antibiotic, cephalosporin, okay? So you have first generation. This is why I'm thinking, I don't know how you guys feel about this so far, but the PowerPoint is more helpful or the actual outline. But the outline, I'm, I think it might be better for you guys to study from that. Um, predominantly against gram-positive bacteria, okay? And then when you go to successive generations, they're going to go against gram-negative bacteria. Here's where it's interesting. Citrobacter, Enterobacter, and some E. coli strands are becoming resistant, okay? And then why and how do they group the generations? It's going to be by their antimicrobial properties, okay? Whether it's a first generation, second generation, et cetera. I want to say, I'm going to get this wrong. <laughs> Do you? Okay, what is it? Four. I was going to say we three. Were, I was uh, going through this slide last night to become a pharmacist. Oh, you were? Everything's right. Oh, okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, gosh, God, that sucks. <laughs> I was going to say three. Okay? Bactracin. Okay, another inhibitor of cell wall synthesis. This is going to be topical application. Um, usually, you can use this for staph infection, and we'll put this on top to hope that the actual carbuncle or whatever it is will come to a head, but it usually doesn't happen that often. They usually have to go in and actually drain it. Um, vancomycin, this one's a pretty important. It has traditionally been reserved as a drug of last resort, however, not so much anymore because of organisms being resistant to it, okay? Okay, and then it's replaced a couple of it's been displaced from the role of newer antibiotics. I don't ask you about the newer antibiotics. I'm more concerned with these two up here, okay? All right. Chloramphenicol. Yay. Bacteriostatic antimicrobial. So what does that mean for that one? Doesn't kill it directly. Paralyzed. Okay. You can say paralyzes, I guess, right? It is. The good thing about this one is that if you look at number two, the second point there, it's effective against a wide variety of both gram positive and gram negative bacteria and also anaerobic organisms. So if you can use this against things, it's good, but what's not so great about it is that it has resistance and there's some safety concerns associated with it. Okay, such as bone marrow toxicity, <laughs> which that makes you feel not so safe taking it. It's really only used for that last point. Anyways. That's the I've last point of user. And is this oral or IV? It's IV. It's IV. Yeah. Okay. Um, not effective, and because I'm putting this up here by itself, you should highlight it. It's not effective against Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Not effective. The thing that is good about it, though, is that it's excellent brain barrier penetration, okay? Um, so this would be the first choice of treatment for staphylococcal brain abscesses. Kind of creepy, right? Okay, brain barrier, blood brain barrier, always a problem when you're talking about antibiotics. What do they usually use for stuff like this, do you know? For the blood brain barrier problem? 
So people are developing the resistance. It's actually the microbes developing the resistance. Okay. So then they will, once this happens, you do something called agents. So you'll have your first line agent, okay, which is based on several factors. Safety, of course, is going to be number one. But actually what I think is number one would be cost, not safety, and the availability. Then you have your second line agents, which is usually broader spectrum, less favorable risk benefit profile, and more expensive. Then your third line agents are the ones that are really ridiculous and cost a lot of money, and basically you're just like putting toxic stuff in your body. So those would be your third line agents. But that's how they kind of like work their way up the line. Yeah. And they also uh, restrict drugs like the uh, or venom and stuff for those third line. Which is, again, creepy, creepy, creepy. Um, variety of mutations can also lead to antibiotic resistance. These would be four mechanisms of antibiotic resistance. You do need to know this for the exam, so I would highlight <coughs> this slide. Okay? I'm not going to go all, through all four of these. It's pretty self-explanatory. Um, plasmids can also occur um, that are transferred between bacteria and resistance genes can also develop from that. Okay. Factors affecting antimicrobials. The pH, cations, or um, inoculum, uh, prepared from a broth that has been incubated for four to six hours. That's never a good thing. Clinical pharmacology, penetration of the agents in the sites of infection, and then inflammatory and immune defenses as well. These would be factors affecting how effective the antimicrobials are going to be. And then selection of antimicrobials. This is really what you're looking at. They're going to be grouped by class. They're going to be looking at the spectrum of the activity the patterns, and what's the bacterial resistance of these guys. Okay, this is going to be based on the selection, or why they're getting selected. I don't know why I keep having these pictures of like drugs in people's hands. <laughs> um, this is on the exam for sure, selection of antimicrobials that need to be reported. Okay, so Antimicrobial agents appropriate, appropriate for the infection should be included in a report. So that definitely should be included in a report. Drugs that are active only in the urinary tract should not be reported if the isolate is coming from another site. <clears throat> and Lance, you can correct me if I'm wrong. They may have this different in the actual hospitals. Um, antimicrobials that don't actually penetrate into a site shouldn't even be reported for the organisms that are isolated from that site. And then chlorophenomenopal for UTIs is inappropriate because it's not excreted in the urine. So that would be another example. Does that sound right to you? Or? The last one? Yeah. We just barely use it there You barely use it anymore. Yeah, because yeah. of the side effects on it. Yeah, the side effects are not good. The side effects are not good at all. <laughs> Beta lactamases, this is what we were talking about a little earlier. Um, really, for the exam, you, I really don't go into beta lactamases. Um, just know that you have antibiotics that are beta lactane, and then you have and then you have uh, pathogens that are beta lactamases, and that's a disruptive factor right there. Okay. Um, resistant pathogens. Here is a just list of resistant pathogens and what they are resistant to. Okay. I don't really ask you anything on this slide. I just wanted to give you kind of an idea of what's going on. But for the Pseudomonas aeruginosa, you can see it's a problem. It's listed just as biofilms because it's almost resistant to almost everything out there, which is the problem. Okay, and this was just a little timeline of MRSA. It's definitely outdated by now. But you can see just in 2000, vancomycin, the powerful antibiotic uses the last resort in treatment. This isn't even accurate anymore because now, 2015, vancomycin is becoming resistant. Or it's becoming resistant to vancomycin. We're seeing a lot of CRE to the carbapenem resistant Lepsiola. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Okay. Um, this is just for your information for detecting methylene resistant staphylococci. This is what they actually do in the lab. So you guys can read over this when you have time. I don't ask you about this on the exam. And then alternatives to resistance. 
these would be what need to happen or should happen if the antibiotic is resistant or if the microbe is resistant, okay? But ras rational use of therapy is always a good one. You know, if it's prescribed for 10 days, try to use it for the 10 days, don't throw it out. If you have a certain amount that you're supposed to be using, use it. I'm the worst one at it, too, and I preach this stuff. Um, all right, any questions antibiotic-wise? You really need to hone in on the different antibiotics, like the penicillins, cephalosporins. You really need to know those slides pretty well. Okay?